Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Appreciate the live stream watching. Thank you very much. Let's all stand and let's sing the solid rock. My hope is built for nothing less. My hope is built on. Let's all remain standing. Brother Danny, lead us in a word of prayer. Father, we just want to tell you we love you, Jesus. We thank you for our church. We thank you for everyone that come out this morning, Lord. And we just want to thank you for all your love, mercy, and grace on our life. And Father, we, as we come here this morning, we like to pray for our sick, the ones that can't be with us today. Father, we just pray that you touch them, heal them, and bring them back to us. And then be with our service this morning, Lord. We pray you be with the singing, the preaching. There be one here today that don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Today to be the day that they ask Jesus to forgive them for their sins. Come in their heart and save them. Bless this service today. We love you. Ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Thank you, Brother Danny. And good Sunday morning. Amen. All right, I want to make sure you just saying, um, I rest upon his unchanging grace. Amen? Right. Let me make sure. Um, you saying, uh, my anchor holds within the veil. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm losing you. <laughs> I, I, that, was, that was a little bit. How about this? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Is that not the truth? I mean, you, you can look around in this world and all other ground is sinking sand. There's only one, one true rock you can stand on, only one person you can really uh, count on, that's Jesus Christ. And guess what? Uh, God's still on the throne. Don't matter about COVID and any, anything else that's going on, it's a good Sunday morning. Amen? Because uh, we know the Lord's in control and... And uh, he's got control of our lives, and uh, he loves us. Jesus died so that we might have eternal life, and uh, he loves us. He cares about us. He wants the best for us. He wants to use us to his honor and his glory. So it is a good Sunday morning. Amen? Okay, just want to make sure. If we have any visitors this morning, your first time visiting with us here in Mill Creek Baptist Church, you would raise your hand. Gentlemen, have a visitor's packet. No visitors this morning. All right. Glad to have all of our regulars with us, and um, I know it's summertime, folks going in and out, maybe trying to get a little time off here and there. I'm not sure where you're going to go, but wherever you go, I hope you have a great time, and, um, and that you enjoy that time with your family and having a, uh, maybe a little getaway time. We got several that we need to continue remembering prayer. Um, we didn't uh, have it put it on the prayer chain, but uh, we'd ask you to pray for Richard Passetti and his family, he passed away, and uh, we need to pray for the family. The uh, funeral is going to be this Tuesday, so if you would uh, keep them in prayer. They're longtime friends of 
Lee and Paul's family and, and, and us, uh, Lee and Renee were, grew up together as best friends. And, uh, so we just, if you would remember, remember them in prayer. Um, I forgot to ask where, where, where are you going this morning? Joel chapter one. Joel chapter one. Start looking, sir. Excuse me. He said, chat. he changed it. He's going, uh, uh <laughs> He's through with chapter one. He's going to chapter two. Joel chapter two, and um, come on up, fellas. You're good. Go, Joel chapter two. You start looking now. Maybe you'll find it by the time he gets ready to uh, to bring the message. Good to have all of you this morning, and let's pray. Father, we do thank you for letting us come to your house this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to be open this morning. We know of churches this morning that have had to close, and uh, Father, for uh, this thing with the COVID. So we thank you for keeping our doors open. Thank you for being able to live stream to the folks at home. And Lord, we do thank you for this good Sunday morning. We pray, Lord, that we'd not take for granted what we have here and how uh, your wonderful blessings that you give us. And Lord, uh, we ask you to bless this offering. Help us again to use the money wisely and uplifting of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've given up on the government, give up on the scientists, but I ain't give up on God. Amen. God, it is no secret what God can do. I'm going to sing that for you. The child. Don't run away and hide 
appreciate you, Brother Jerry. Great job on that song. Beautiful song. Let's all stand. Amazing Grace, 244. sound good this morning. Sing this one for you this morning goes with the message all because of God's amazing grace.
Satan, he took my place. Oh, someday, some glorious morning, I shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Oh, someday. It's all, all because of God's amazing grace. Look and see if, okay, it's my turn. All right. I hope you found your scripture by now. Joel chapter 2. Now, Brandon told me he just put a battery in this clock up here that I watch. Uh, and uh, he said it might stop. <laughs> so if it does, don't get nervous, okay? Joel chapter 2, start with me at verse number 12. Joel chapter 2 and verse number 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord... Turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend, rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Aren't you glad of that? Lord, he's not like some of us that fly off the handle, you know, at the drop of a hat. He's slow to anger. In other words, it takes a lot to make him mad. And uh, you don't want to make God mad. You really don't want to do that. Slow to anger. And of great kindness. That's a kind God. And repenteth him of the evils. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a have and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpets in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they, they say among the people, where is your God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beast of the fields, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. 
The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord, your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. You know, Israel and the United States has a mysterious connection. They are kind of like sisters. You know, if you think about it, there's no other nation on the earth that uh, kind of goes together like Israel and America. I mean, they both had amazing beginnings. Uh, they both have been blessed mightily by God. God loved Israel and he loves America. And so that's why we use a whole lot of time. Uh, we use Israel as a picture of what God is doing and is going to do for America because it is in reality a picture of it. Now here we find in our scripture this morning that Israel is in trouble once again. They have experienced a terrible drought and a, a, a vast army of locusts has invaded them. And this has left the land ruined and desolate. Amazingly here, God uses nature as his enemies as a means of divine judgment upon Israel. Now his purpose is to try to awaken them, to awaken their hearts, and to call them back to him. Now when you read through the book of Joel, it's only three chapters and it doesn't take long to read it, but you find God has brought judgment upon them but he does not give anywhere in the book a specific reason uh, for that judgment. It's not because they had turned to idolatry. It's not because they have been uh, uh, particularly uh, 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 disobedient or anything. It, the main thing that you find here is for one reason or another that is not mentioned, they have turned their backs on God. And this is about drawing them back to him. Back to him, you see. Now, the book of Joel is a book about judgment. In reality, if you wanted to take this book and use it as such, this Joel, the chapter 1, 2, and 3, is a panoramic picture of from the beginning to the middle to the end of the church. When we turned away from God, God brought us back, and finally God's coming to get us. It's all one big panoramic picture. You could use it that way. But God's people need to understand, and this is what I believe that the book of Joel uh, brings out more than anything else, is that in the midst of divine judgment, which they are going through, in the midst of them, they are still, they still have hope if they will seek the Lord. That's what he tells them that if they will seek the Lord. The book of Joel looks back to the people's judgment for their sin against God, but it looks forward to the time when they're going to enjoy the blessings of God that they used to enjoy in years gone by. Now, my friend, I believe like Israel, we live in a land today that is under divine judgment. I believe that. And I tell you, I have, I have been under this idea for uh, several 
years that judgment was coming, it, it was creeping in. And I believe today as we sit here, America is under divine judgment just like Israel was. I hate to even think about it, but our country's falling apart. It's falling apart e everywhere you look. And our leaders are doing more and more to try to divide us more and more. And my friend, it is bringing about chaos in our country. And I believe because of that, God, as we'll get into just a little bit later, God, I believe, is judging America today. You know, I got up this morning a little earlier than normal, and I, uh, I looked on the, on the, the TV, and uh, I kind of just surfed through several channels there of church services and things. You know, it's amazing how many preachers today are preaching out of the Revelation. It's amazing today how many preachers are preaching about the coming of the Lord. It, it, it's amazing to me uh, whenever I, I see that. I believe that God's ministers, God's preachers across this country are seeking, are seeing something that is starting to happen. And there is a theory today among certain preachers and certain congregations of people that believe that we are in the beginning of the tribulation. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe we're in the tribulation, but they are preaching. Some of them are preaching that very doctrine that we are in the first part of the tribulation now. I don't believe that, but I believe, my friend, it appears that way to a lot of people today. But these verses that we're going to share with you today, my friend, I, I, I want to be able to, to show you the judgment that's coming and the judgment that's happening, but I want to encourage you today to understand that in spite of this, it's not too late. There is hope. There is hope. I don't believe it's ever too late with God, you see. I want us to look through these things just a little bit today and just see what God has for us. I want to look at number one. I want to look at the problem that we have before us today. I want you to turn back to chapter one. Chapter one. Let's look at what was going on, the problem that brought about chapter two and three of this book. In number, chapter number one, look and start with me, if you will, at verse number one, and we'll read through verse number four. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Penthuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land, Hath this been in your days even or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust have left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar hath eaten. So here's the problem, my friend. They face devastation. And he asked here, he, he, he says, uh, you old men give, and all you inhabitants given here, have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like what's going on today? I mean, some of you are my age. I've never seen nothing like that. I've never seen nothing like what's going on, it seems like. And so he's, a, he's amazed, more or less, as he asks the people, have you ever seen anything like this? One insect invasion right after another destroyed and ruined their crops. And so consequently, there was no food for, uh, for the people, left for the people. They were being devastated by insects. And look, at, look on with, that, with me at verse 5 and 6 and 7. Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine. 
because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek, uh, uh, teeth in, of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are all made white. They were devastated because of the destruction that had come upon them because they had been invaded by an army of insects. Locusts and canker worms and caterpillars and kind of other things like that, you see. They were, they t he says, the, the, these armies came in and destroyed their crops and these armies were strong and they were numerous, he says. And, and we can't stop it. There's, we don't have the power to stop it. It seemed as though that they were going to be starved to death and utterly destroyed because of this insect invasion. Look on down to verse 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for her, for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languishes. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withheld from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. How, you ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your Lord. They faced devastation. They faced uh, destruction. They faced utter, my friend, ruin. A severe drought had followed the locusts. You see, there was no rain. There were, the crops had all failed. The wild animals suffered and the wild animals were perished uh, because there was no water for the pasture for the, the wild animals. And on top of that, when you, if you go on over to verse 18 and 20, you find that great fires had broken out all over the land. So look what's happening. They've been invaded by all of these animals. The dro these are uh, insects that had destroyed all their crops and everything. And then the rain was withheld. And so everything dried up and withered and died. And then on top of that, there was a great fire that came and destroyed what was left. Five times in this chapter, in chapter one and chapter two, Joel called this the day of the Lord. You know what the day of the Lord is? A day of judgment. And that's what God was doing here. He was judging his people for their sins, for their sins, even though they're not specifically numbered and uh, no specific sin. It's just for the general sins of the people in turning away from him. I read this little three chapters through. I read it through probably five or six times. And as I, each time I read it, uh, I, I could, not, could not look at what the judgment was falling upon the, the nation of Israel, but what I was reminded of the judgment that's falling upon us today. See? Can there be any doubt that we are facing the judgment of Almighty God today. Open your eye that this, you see this is judgment against, by God against the nation of Israel. But open your eyes and look around. Natural disasters. They, they rip through our nation with far greater frequency than I've ever seen. Every time you turn around, you see, uh, when one part of the country is gripped by drought, and the other part of the country is, is, is flooded with flood waters and everything and destroying everything and it's causing higher prices. Have you been to the grocery store lately? 
Well, you better take an extra checkbook when you go. I'm an old grocery man. I'm an old grocery man. I remember grinding 8 o'clock coffee. You, you, you ever been in, the, in an A&P store and where they were grinding? You know, they used to buy the coffee, came just the coffee beans in their bag. You got up to the checkout stand, they put it in a coffee grinder and ground it for you however you want it. Oh, it smells so good. It, if you've ever done it, it smells real, real good and everything. And we, that's what we did. But you know how much back when I was doing that, when I was grinding 8 o'clock coffee, you know what a pound of 8 o'clock coffee cost? 39 cents. The last time I went to the grocery store, they sell 8 o'clock coffee at Winn-Dixie. It was $8 and something a pound. Higher food prices, tornadoes, hurricanes, fires all across the Midwest and the West out there. Tens of billions of dollars worth of damage done to the land. Wars that take our brightest and youngest people. Diseases that we've never heard of before. I never heard of some of the diseases that they're talking about today just in the last few years. I was Read the other day, or I heard on the news that we got a new one in Texas now called monkeypox. Now, I ain't kidding you. I told Marty this yesterday or the day before, and she laughed. She thought I was joking. Well, I ain't. I ain't. It originated in Nigeria, and it was brought over by some fella on an airplane. And now there are several people in Texas have monkeypox. Man, we got bird flu. Swine flu, monkeypox, COVID, all these other things in there. Have you ever, he asked these people, Joel, he said, have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like this? I don't think you have. I don't think you've ever seen what's going on today like it's going on today. And I wonder sometimes, am I the only one that sees this? I mean, can't, don't you see it? that all of these things are happening with greater and greater frequencies? And then you add to that all of the sin that runs rampant throughout our country today. We're living in a generation that, 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 that calls evil good and good evil. We're living in a society today that protects the wicked and punishes the righteous. We're living in a day that where People are living actually in fear today. People are afraid. Sin has replaced sanity, it seems like. And greed has replaced God. In my mind this morning, there's no doubt that America is under the awesome judgment of God as we sit here right now. I can see it in our homes. I can see it in our, our homes today are in terrible shape. You know, there used to be, you know, used to the greatest time of fellowship in the home was around the dinner table, wasn't it? Who meets at the dinner table now? Nobody. Nobody does. No, nobody has a family dinner. I, I was watching the Waltons the other day. I like to watch the Walton sometime. But that was, they're great. They all got together around that big old long table and fellowship. We don't do that no more. We don't do that. You get your plate off of the stove or off of the table today and go sit in front of the TV so you can watch the ball game and eat your dinner. Right? Say, oh, me or amen, one of the two. We see it in our streets. Buildings burning, houses burning, cars burning, people breaking windows, robbing stores. We see it everywhere. But the most devastating thing that I believe is taking place today is you can see it in our churches. You can see it in our churches. Preaching has been replaced by praise songs. 
Holiness has given way to happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. Commitment's been replaced by complacency. Our churches are full in a lot of places, but the altars are empty. We get more, today we get more excited about a shopping trip to Walmart than we do about a revival in the church. Or a, either a hunting trip or it's a, vacant, a vacation somewhere. We get more excited about that and worked up than we do about what's taking place in God's house. We've lost our fire today in our churches. We've lost our power today in our churches. We have no desire for the things of God. And God's judging us for it. We'd rather play today than pray. We'd rather have our ears tickled today than have our hearts searched by the word of God. We'd rather just stay as we are. Don't rock the boat, preacher. We're happy where we are. They don't want to be challenged to, for holiness to live for the Lord. And that's why our nation's in the shape it's in. Listen, when you read the book, notice all the time God says something to the like of, if my people, who's he talking to? My, he, he's not talking to the government. He's not talking to the drunk in the bar. He's talking to his people. If my people, my people, my people, if my people do this, if my people do that, who's he talking? We his people. We his people. He's talking to us. Where is the problem? In the churches. See? Our nation's in shape, the shape it's in because today our, our churches are in the shape they're in. We are experiencing a spiritual drought just like they were having a physical drought. Young people have little time for, for the Lord of the Lord's house today. We've become cold and impotent and idle in God's house. I believe today God is saying to us that you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. That's the problem. We're going through the same thing, the same judgment that they were going through. That's the reason I said Israel and the United States are just like blood sisters. Just like blood sisters. Judgment upon the people of God. So what happens? Well, even though they are experiencing the judgment of God, God says there's still hope for you. There's still hope for you. And so he issues a plea to the people, you see. God pleads to them to, to come back to me, to come back to me. He, he pleads for them to return to where they once were with him. And so he issues five pleas. Five, please. Turn over to chapter 2. Now, this is what's happening. Judgment is on the nation, but it's yet it's God that's trying to get the people. He pleads with the people to return to him, you see? And so look at chapter 2 where we started off and verses 12 through 14. He says, There also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, and not your garments, and return unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. There's a rep God is pleading for them to repent. That's what he's pleading for them for. Genuine repentance was their only hope of escaping the judgment of God. God, God calls them to turn back to him. He, and notice he says, with all your heart. Evidently they didn't have, he didn't have all their heart. And that's the reason they're experiencing the judgment. Does God have all of our heart today? Does God have all of your heart today? Is God first and foremost in your life today? I'll answer that for you because I don't want you to get embarrassed. I'll tell you, no. No, he's not. He calls on them, render 
uh, your, 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 your hearts and not your garments. Rend your heart. And, not, and that's what he's saying. God is not looking for external religion. He's looking for a heart change. A heart change. He's looking for a people that are sorrowful over what's taking place in their land. He's looking for a people that are broken over their sinful condition, but are willing to change from it. That's the kind of people and the only kind of people that God blesses and restores and uses are those kind of people. See, he's looking for those kind of people. Now, I know people today, because we've heard this from time to time, you see, about repentance, about turning back to God. But I want to tell you something, folks. That's the only hope we got. That's the only hope we got. Are you waiting on deliverance from Washington? If you are, you're a nut. Just totally a nut. My friend, repentance towards God is the only hope for America as it was the only hope for Israel. See, God is still today looking for people who are sorrowful about their sin, who are sorry that they've allowed that to happen. He's looking for people that, that will be honest with him and be open with him and repent before him. And his blessings can flow that way, but that's the only way they're going to come. See, he, he told us in Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. My friend, listen, God wants us to repent. He says, but he that confesseth and forsaketh his sins shall find mercy. The only hope that Israel had, God told them, my friend, the only hope that they had from being saved from the judgment of God was God's people to repent and turn back to God. When the church comes home, America will be affected. See? And, but until God's people repent, our churches are still going to be dead and powerless my friend, and there's going to be no hope for our nation and no hope for our church. No hope. As long as the church continues to walk in rebellion, and I, when I say the church, I'm talking about me and you. I'm talking about me and you. As long as the church continues to walk in rebellion against God, my friend, the world is going to mock us. And they are today. They're mocking us, see? When we repent and are restored, my friend, to a place of blessings, then the world will be forced to acknowledge that there is a God in heaven. Look at verse 15 through 17. He makes another plea. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call for a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, Assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chambers and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people. God is pleading for restoration. God wants to restore them. This is the plainest book in the Bible to show you and me how much God wants us to turn back to him. God is willing to plead with these people to let him restore them. He calls on, on their, spirit, his, their spiritual leaders to come back to him. He wants his people to get hungry for him one more time. Are you hungry for the things of God? How many of you got up this morning and said, boy, get to go to church today? Don't raise your hand. No, we don't. We take this for granted. We take it for granted. What we did this morning, we got up and then we took a vote. 
among the house. Are we going to church today? Because if it's going to rain, you know, I don't want to go. Okay. Uh, I, I, I really, I need, I need to, I've got something I bought at Walmart and I need to return it today. Okay. That's us. See, that's us. We live in a generation today that puts everything in place of God. Everything in place of God. Our desire, what makes us happy, comes before God. We don't give him his place of priority. Everything about our life as his people ought to revolve around him and his will. Does it? But you expect him to bless you when you pray, don't you? When you sick, people get sick, you expect to pray to God and he raise them up, don't you? When you have a financial hardship or, or some other kind of hardship, you pray to God and expect him to take care of it, don't you? Well, tell me something. Why should he? Why should he? Hey. You didn't need him last week. You didn't need him last month. You didn't need him last Sunday. Where were you last Sunday? Was he in church or somewhere else? You didn't need him. See? And you expect God to bless you. It kind of makes me think we're not too smart. We live in a generation that yields itself to everything but God. The church has to come home. God is pleading with Israel to come home. I want to restore you. I want to bless you. I want to be your God once more. Come home. And that's what he's saying to the church. That's what he's saying to America. We need to reach a place where God is our first priority. We ought not to make a move without consulting God. You ought not to make a decision without consulting God. Don't you care what he wants for you? You should. We need to come to the place where, where we are willing to acknowledge our sin and then rededicate ourselves to him. That's our only hope so he can restore us. So God pleads with them. He pleads with them. He judges them and then he pleads with them to come back, to come back. I, I want to tell you, my friend, God is anxiously waiting for his people to come back to him. You and me and thousands of others just like you and me. And he tells them more or less next that if you will, he makes them a promise. He makes them a promise. He's, he, we've seen the problem and we've seen him pleading with them to, to gather the people together and sanctify yourselves and, and uh, uh, weep and do all these things, repent. He says, if you do these things, I know judgment is going on out there. I know the canker worms and the locusts are eating the crop. But if you'll just come back to me, here's what I'll do for you. I will restore you. Look at verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied wherewith therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach unto the brethren. But I will remove afar off from you the northern army. He, he calls those locusts uh, an army. Uh, the northern army, wherever I was, and will drive him to a barren and desolate Lamb his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea and his stink shall. In other words, I'll defeat your enemies for you and I'll make you happy and I'll restore you. You see, he promises to feed them. He promises to bless them. He says, I will satisfy you. See, if 
you'll come back to me. If you'll come back to me. I don't believe but that there's a saved person in this room today that doesn't long to see God bless America and his churches once again. I do. I do. I long to see God bless America. I long to see God bless our churches. See? I believe every true child of God has a desire to see the Lord move among his people one more time. You know, God's done it in the past. We've had some what they call great awakenings. Great awakenings. When God moved and people repented and got saved. See? God promises to send them uh, the former rain and the latter rain. Those things were necessary for their crops, but there had been a drought. They hadn't had the former land rain and the latter rain. The, the former rain usually comes in uh, October and November. The latter rain comes in March and April. And what that does, that replenishes the soil so they can reap big crops and everything. But they hadn't had that because there's been a drought. But God says, I'll send them back. I'll send them back to you, you see. He also promised to replace everything that's been lost during the drought and during the devastation of the locusts. In other words, God's promising a revival to his people. See? That's what America needs today. That's what America needs today, a revival. See? We need the Lord to open the windows of heaven once again and pour us out a blessing. We need him to give back everything that we've allowed the enemy to take from us. We, we, need, we need a revival of God's presence among his people. I'm not sure that in most of our churches across this land today, if God hasn't just about written most of us off. We need a presence of God where the Holy Spirit of God brings conviction upon hearts and helps us to see where we are and see what we need to do. We need a revival of his conviction. People have no convictions today. Anything and everything goes. We do what we want to do when we want to do it, regardless of anything, and nothing's going to keep us from it. We're going to do it. Now, listen, the only hope is God to bless us once again. In verse number 26, he promises rejoicing once again. I, I don't think they had much rejoicing while the uh, locusts were eating the crops and while the fires were burning all the fields and, and while the, the drought was taking place and there was no rain, there was no rejoicing. But God promises that I'll give you something to rejoice again. God wants it. God, you know, the Bible teaches us that God inhabits our, our praises, our rejoicing when we praise him. He wants that. See, if you look at the average modern church today, there's no reason for rejoicing. There's no reason for rejoicing. Entertainment, recreation, carnality, they've replaced worship and consecration and holiness. As I said, pre preaching has given way to praise songs now. I watch in churches and they, they sing praise songs for 30, 45 minutes, and then the preacher preaches for 10. And I know you say, where is that church? I want to go there. <laughs> but, see? Standards of dress. See? I, I, I remember, I remember... The time when mama and grandma made a little bun on the back of their head with their hair, they dressed down to their ankles and up around their neck and went to God's house. Do you, you remember that? Do, do, are you old enough to remember that? Look at how people come to church today. Short pants flip-flops, T-shirts, 
look like they just come from hauling garbage to the dump. No respect for God's house. No respect for God's house. Somebody asked me a while back, you know, why do you still wear a coat and a tie? I represent the most high king. I don't want to look like a bum. I ain't coming to church with preaching you with my blue jeans on with holes in the knees and a camouflage shirt. The church has ceased to be a place where people are challenged to get right, challenged to live right, challenged to get in service to God. I tell you, I, 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 I've been in this for 50 some odd years now and the church today, and I guarantee you anybody that's older than me will, uh, will uh, verify this, the church today is a far cry from the church of yesterday. Can you deny that? I don't think you can. There used to be a day when, when, when men of God climbed in the pulpit and took the word of God and preached it to the people without apology. And today, the man of God uh, climbs in the pulpit today and says, I want to tell you how you can be a better you. But you're as good a you as you're going to be. Hey. You as good a you as you're going to be, which ain't much. Ain't much. Say, uh, I wish I had another hour and a half. <laughs> well, let me tell you this. I believe, now this is my belief, this is my conviction. It don't have to be yours, and it probably isn't, but that's okay. I believe that the church will experience one more revival before Jesus comes. The only thing that bothers me is what is it going to take to bring about that revival? Is it going to take another world war? Is it going to take America to go bankrupt? Is it going to take the dollar to be de devalued where a dollar is worth about 15 cents? And everybody loses all of their retirement and their, and their nest egg and all and everything. What's it going to take? What's it going to take for that revival to come about? I believe, there, I believe before Jesus comes, there will be another awakening. I, I, I can't tell you exactly why I believe that, but I, I just believe that, you see. I believe it's going to come a day when... The world's not going to laugh at the church anymore. You see, today, they, they, if, you're, if you're a Christian and you're trying to live for the Lord, they call it, they, the, church, the world calls you weak. They say you're out of touch. They say that you, uh, you have these outdated superstitious beliefs. I mean, you still believe that somewhere in a faraway land, some man uh, died, uh, was killed, and, and he rose from the dead, and he walked on water. And, and you, you still believe all these outdated superstitions. And they say, you're crazy. Hey. They say we need to forget about the Bible. They say we need to forget about preaching Jesus as the only way for salvation. They say that, here's what the world says about you, that you are a mental, an intellectual cripple. That's what you are to them. You are a mental, intellectual cripple. That you can't make it from one day to another without your religion. Well, they're wrong about a lot of things, but they're right about one thing. I can't make it from one day to another without Jesus. I can tell you that. But when God comes back to his people and gets his people coming back to him, there'll be no doubt as to who is in charge, see. So brothers and sisters, it's not too late. Today it's not too late, see. It's not too late to save our churches. It's not too late to save our country. 
It's not too late, my friend, for the, to save the next generation. Don't you care anything about the next generation? Some of you got grandkids that, uh, that are anywhere from three, four, five years old, six years old, seven years old, on up to uh, 15, 20, 25. Some of you got 40-year-old grandkids. But don't you care anything about what's going to be like for them? Some of you are looking forward to having grandkids, maybe. Now, can you imagine what church and what America is going to be like for them? See? But we can't save the church. We can't save America. We can't save the next generation without divine help. God called these people, come back to me, and I will restore to you Everything that you had before, it'll be like it was. I'll give you all of it back if you'll come back to me. If we're going to see the God of heaven meet our needs, we're going to have to change our ways. We're going to have to get back to God. We're going to have to get back to him. We're going to have to wake up and clean up and stand up for what we know is right. This is what Paul told the church at Rome. I want to read this to you, Romans chapter 13, real quick. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and following. This is what he wrote to the church there. And that knowing the time, well, we know what time it is, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. You're closer to heaven today than you were the day that you surrendered to Jesus Christ. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. It's not too late, folks. It's not too late. But things have to change. For God to bless his people. If you're wanting the blessings of God, then my friend, our lives are going to have to demand it by the way we live. God, please with us to come back to him. I want to bless you. I want to meet your need. I want to be your God once again, like he probably was at one time. It's amazing to me how God pleads with his people to love him. Isn't that amazing? He has to beg his people to love him. He's begging you this morning to love him and to serve him. Father, thank you today.